Divorce is hard enough on the adults involved, but imagine if you're the child and your parents are divorcing. Learn about the effects of divorce on children and how you can help your child adjust, next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. Divorce is particularly challenging for couples with children who need to negotiate their own loss while helping their children negotiate theirs, all while trying to figure out how to co-parent with an ex whom you may not want to be around. Challenging situation, which is why I've invited two wonderful guests with me tonight to talk about children and divorce. So start calling in your questions right now, locally. Dial 218-788-2844 or call toll free at 1-877-307-8762. And you can also email them using the address listed at the bottom of your screen. Now let's meet these wonderful guests. Saprina Matheny oversees the Trauma Assessment and Family Treatment Program at the Human Development Center, and she's also the Clinical Program Manage Manager for the AMBIT Network at the University of Minnesota. And Paul Goosens is a licensed psychologist with Harbor City Psychological Associates, where he works with children and their families. Thanks to both of you for coming you. out tonight. And I think, Saprina, we're gonna start with um, one of the big questions, which is, should parents stay together for the sake of the children? I think that's a really common thought that a lot of parents have, and they, they have it with their children's best interest in mind. But I also think that it's important to remember that the relationships that, parents see, that kids see between their parents become the template for the adult relationships the kids will have. So if there's tension or people are only staying together for the well-being of the kids, it really is doing them a disservice in the long run. And so we don't mean that parents should just give up easily. Well, I, I, I think so as well. That you know, this is it's it's hard work. It's hard work doing that. It'd be, and being in a relationship and a marriage and, and with kids and all that. So I, I think it's it's to, to really be mindful and clear that that's the decision and the why for and, and what have you. And, and I work more with the older adolescents, and I think sometimes parents have this idea that maybe we'll wait until they're they're teenagers because then it'll be easier. And it, it's arbitrary. It's, it's not easy at any right. time. So if, if now we have, let's say we have two parents and they've decided to go ahead and divorce, how do, let's start sort of at the beginning, which is yeah. how do you tell the children? Well, ideally we'd like the parents to be able to be on the same page and tell the children together mm -hmm. and to really keep it kind of child-centered. So depending on the child's age, you might tell them more or less information, but really keep them away from the adult information. You know, so that we, so it's saying things to younger children like, you know, we no longer love each other or, you know, we've, you know, we want to move on rather than, you know, kind of all of the details that may have led up to the divorce. But the most united front that they can present. And how might what you say to teenagers vary a little differently than what you would say to younger kids? You know, I, I think so much the same message that, that the relationship between the parents has changed but ideally the relationship and the love and the commitment and unconditional love certainly towards the children, that's, that's a solid, theoretically and hopefully, that that hasn't changed. Uh, but teenagers are gonna have maybe more questions or more uh, uncertainties, uh, and, and, and so I think there's, there's some more information about uh, the implications, certainly, that, that may be uh, mm -hmm. pertinent to the teen. But again, that boundary between what's mom and dad's business, the how come, who's to blame, what for, what happened, that's adult stuff. That's, and teenagers particularly, I think younger kids as well, but teenagers particularly oftentimes want to insert themselves into some of that information because they really want to understand. Sorry, that's really still adult business. I think that's a really important point that you make, Paul, which is that um, even when teenagers um, want more of that information and ask for more of that, yeah. that information, that parents be prepared to draw the line and say, you know, that puts you in the middle. If I talk with you about that and your dad and I agreed or your mom and I agreed that we're right. not gonna put you in, in the middle yeah. of that. Um, facilitating a good adjustment, and that's gonna be different depending on the age of the kids. Right. So let's talk about, I guess, start with that, the, the very young child and 
um, name some things that parents can do for the very young child in facilitating a good adjustment to divorce? Well, I think for young children to understand that the, dif the adjustment is difficult, but also to try to keep things as consistent as possible. So kids may be moving back and forth between homes, but trying to keep things like bedtimes the same or close to the same, um, trying to allow them to have some say in terms of what, you know, what stuff goes where. Um, and they may want to bring some stuff back and forth with them, like their favorite teddy bear or some items, and, and trying to support them um, and recognize that that's part of kind of how they're, they're coping and getting through that adjustment. Um, so I think consistency is one of the big ones. And I also think the other part is to make it okay for the child to have enjoyable time with the other parent mm -hmm. when they're with them. And to not say things like, oh, I didn't do anything when you were gone, or, you know, it's hard, I miss you. You know, those well-intentioned things sometimes can be interpreted with kids about, oh, mom was sad or dad was sad. Mm -hmm. I hope you were having fun at dad's house because I was miserable home crying while you were gone. You've, not you've not heard what you that would, before, not what, you? not what you would recommend? <laughs> exactly. No, not at all. Again, that's about boundaries. I, I think the key, key thing here is, you know, boundaries, 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 those emotional boundaries. And, and I think with the older crowd and adolescents who are either going through uh, the divorce at the time or have gone through that previously and are still struggling with some aspects of that, you know, that, that sense of continuity uh, and, and continuation of some of those, those rituals and routines as much as possible. I think an additional flavor that the teenager brings to that is, is that they've got a life outside of the family probably more so than the younger crowd. So time with peers, time with friends, time at school activities and things. Which that, often that those is, are able to continue as well. And, and often is what the teenager is most concerned about, particularly if they're not yet a driving teenager, right? Yeah. Like, and they have, if, if their mm -hmm. friends are closer to what their home has been, yeah. and now they're having to, to transition to another house that's farther away from that, the concern sometimes appears to be more of my proximity to my friends than my proximity to my other yeah. parents. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think that's one of the big things when parent, when kids say, I don't want to go, sometimes parents interpret that there's something bad happening rather than it might be that they can't just watch their like friend's the house kids, and yeah. <clears throat> that's what they've liked or been used to or, you know, that, that one parent has slightly different rules about, you know, how much TV time or how many video game time you have. Yeah. And teenagers, let's back up just a second in terms of that whole process of divorce. Teenagers often have some say in who they get to live with in any kind of custody arrangement as well. And, and because the courts are giving teenagers some more influence, um, that adds a real tricky dynamic uh, because teenagers will share with me, I mean, there's this sense of split loyalties. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, us adults, we're not always mature. <laughs> And, and so sometimes we're, we're putting the, the, the children of the pawn, and, and that becomes the, um, uh, where, where the kids will oftentimes share, the teens will share with me, they, they feel like they're you know, part of the possessions that are getting divvied up or controlled mm -hmm. um, versus you know, really a person. And, and so they feel that sense of loyalty, that sense of terror uh, when, when being asked, you know, where do you want to live? And many times they say, I, I want my family back. Right. <laughs> you know, that's their ideal. And I, I think building on to what you said, that sometimes they, they feel like one parent might need more taken care of yes. than the other. And so they'd wanna, they want to live with the parent who maybe needs more taken care of or that they think, you know, needs them more. Or the parent who, I want to live with the parent who will let me do everything I want. <coughs> How about that one? Sign ever, me up for ever, that club. Ever, yeah. ever exactly. hear that? Ever hear exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that, that brings to another question, and um, what I hear a lot in my office is uh, one par a parent who is divorced um, who is concerned because the rules need to be the same in both of the houses. So, mm -hmm. Sabrina, talk to us a little bit about how important that is and whether that's different depending on the age of the child. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in an ideal world, the rules are pretty consistent. But the reality is that kids are pretty good at knowing what rules are what in different places. You know, the, the gym teacher has different rules mm -hmm. than the math teacher does. And so they deal with that all the time. And I think it's being able to say to kids, that's not the rule at our house. Or that there's a different, you know, your dad gets to have a different rule or your mom gets to have a different rule. But having that conversation in a really kind of neutral, matter of fact way, um, I think is an important way of helping kids understand that that's kind of how the world works. And in teenagers, what would you say? There? I think very similarly. Sometimes we'll have, you know, the what stays in Vegas, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So that same sort of thing. What happens there is there. 
that's that about you know and what here is here here are our rules here are our routines here's the why I'm doing it this way um, and again staying out of that sort of compare contrast but just as a matter of factly and, and, and I use that same metaphor oftentimes of kids figure this out they've got mm -hmm. different teachers mm -hmm. they've got different authority in their lives and, and they'll figure that out and and you know I forgot to say at the beginning of the show and this is really important that what we're talking about here is we're talking about kind of that if there is such a thing that the normal divorce we are yeah. not talking about abuse situations we're not mm -hmm. talking about families who separate because there is abuse in the family or trauma going on that is ge generated in the family that is not the situation that we're talking because that is that's a whole different episode and we're not doing that episode <laughs> yeah. tonight yeah. so we're talking just a, right we're, yeah. right we're talking <laughs> about those parents who really do have the ability to just step back and let your kid adjust almost because mm -hmm. your, your child will adjust if you give yeah. them an opportunity to. And, and, and what I found when I, when I talk to the different parents is, is quite frankly, you know, they, they have separated and divorced for their reasons and they have had mm -hmm. those, those conflicts and pains, what have you. Um, but, but when it comes to child rearing and, and parenting, really most of them are, are closer together than they are apart in terms of their their key values, what they want for their children to grow up and be responsible and healthy, you know, young citizens, et cetera, and successful in school. And, and so, you know, I find myself oftentimes with parents trying to really key in on those pieces that they really have similarity about and build on that and, and, and help grow that and, and, you know, encourage that through use of mediation sort of processes versus maybe a more antagonistic uh, court process, but to, to help them understand that they really have similar goals with each other and then and then build on that and I think that that really helps the kids mm -hmm. um, feel much more secure and here's a question um, from a, a man in Duluth who asks this is kind of building on what you were saying Paul but Sabrina will have you answer the question mm -hmm. or have you start with it how does a non-custodial parent work out arrangements to see the child and so that kind of gets at that question of there's often a custody agreement <coughs> that the court right. hands down. Mm -hmm. And then there is the, how do you work this out with the other parent? Right. And I think that gets to be part of where some of those hurt feelings can come in and really complicate things. And I think one of the messages I try to convey with parents is that the quantity of time is not the same as quality time. And so talking about, you know, what, you know, here's really what you want to do with your child or why you want to spend time with your child and trying to get at you know, hopefully a reasonable conclusion with that where each parent can recognize that the child really wants and deserves a relationship with the other. Um, so I think it's tricky when you're the non-custodial parent, but I think trying to ask for time, um, trying to ask for time where maybe it works, you know, where you're taking into consideration some of those other activities that the child may have, um, I think that becomes a big one. Uh, so you're not you know, taking them away from their favorite Saturday activity but you can help facilitate that or what are some things that you can go to that your child might be involved in that you could you can come and and see them doing or a class you can take them to so looking for not only time you know like a weekend but also some of those other natural times mm -hmm. Um, for like transportation, th or those natural parenting activities right. that you that you probably did in the um, that that you probably did when you were married, and you know, parent A couldn't take them to hockey, and so parent B <laughs> did. Yeah. And yeah. and why can't that continue, right? right. So what and, and and part of what this brings up too is this concept of I think parents sometimes have this notion that there is an ideal shared parenting agreement right. and that everything has to be you know split down the middle um, I get the washer you get the dryer therefore we get the kids 50 percent of the time and talk about how 50 50 isn't always the best it is, isn't always the best and as I mentioned earlier that the, the, the child I mean the teenagers will often tell me well, when's my time <laughs> you know um, whether it's with friends or with my activities and and again when it's when it's perceived as 50 50 is more of a competition of boy if if the other parent has another 20 minutes somehow I've lost um, and so I often find myself helping parents recognize again it's not a it's not a win-lose it's not a zero-sum game but it's, it's it's about what what works for junior and and ideally for for the mom and the dad or both parents whoever it'd be best possible to kind of sort that out and every family is going to be different different levels of activity different extended family uh, mm -hmm. variables and considerations so uh, it, it really has to be sort of individualized for 
what works best for the, for the, that child or, or, or kids. Um, and if there's multiple children, sometimes it works well to tag team that, you know, mm -hmm. one might have some, some time alone with the other parent or the non-custodial parent. So there's all those variables to play in. But if, if the parents approach it from a, uh, a mutually supportive problem-solving approach right. versus a zero-sum game competitive approach, it's a very, very different outcome. And, mm -hmm. and what I tell parents oftentimes is these kids are pretty bright. They grow up and they figure it out. And they remember and they understand how that worked. When and it, it really is sometimes, I think, for parents changing the manner in which they have become used to interacting with each other, which is in this acrimonious way, right? right? And so yeah. their most recent history of interacting with each other is who wins the fight. Who wins the fight. And now we're, we're wanting to go back to when you got along Right. And when you, when you work together, and which I think is really challenging for parents in the beginning, um, mm -hmm. but the sooner that they can get to that point, the better that they're helping their children adjust. Let's talk a little bit about what typical kids might go through during a divorce. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? So, and, and I think, again, this is like a developmental thing. Yeah, yeah very much Right? Is. What a six-year-old looks like uh, at the beginning of a par parental divorce situation is different than a 16-year-old. So right. let's start with those younger kids first. Well, I think in some of those early elementary kids, you might see what almost looks like a regression. You know, so kids might have a little bit more difficulty separating. They might want to, you know, be closer to you all of the time or uh, might be more tearful when they go to school, um, just more globally anxious they might be more irritable, they might have some difficulty falling asleep, um, they might, you know, look, be sad or be more tearful. And I think that continues as kids get, get older and move into to some of those middle, you know, that 10-year-old kind of entering middle school. Sometimes you can see irritability, kind of anger or mood swings that come out of nothing. You're like, I don't know what I did and why you're yelling at me. <laughs> um, you know, kind of like the, the teenager, but it's a little earlier and it's, of a little bit different um, origination. Um, and then adolescence, I think you can see some more moodiness or some withdrawal. Um, sometimes you can also see the desire to spend more time with, with a parent, um, but I think a lot of times they're kind of focused on their friends mm -hmm. and wanting to be maybe more with their friends because that's something that's predictable. Um, and then some of those sleep difficulties and things like that as yeah, well. I so. think so too. Yeah. Sometimes uh, what I've noticed with, t with teenagers in particular is that the one thing that both of the parents have in common is that the teenager likes neither one of them. Um, exactly. And, you know, and, and, and that moment, and actually, you know, when, we're, when they're searching for common ground, yeah. Um, that is almost a place to start from of like, wow, this is hard for both of us, right? That, and, and that establishes this, like, well, we can agree on that part of it. Yeah. I think the other thing with kids transitioning is to have an understanding that when kids transition, those first couple hours that they come back to your house, maybe even the first day they come back to your house, might be a little bit more difficult. They might be kind of more challenging or more defiant or more tearful. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that what was happening at the other house was bad. It just means that they're adjusting. And they haven't quite worked out the pace at, w at the adjustment that we as adults may think that they should have. Yeah, and I think a lot of that reaction at that time of adjustment, you know, that, that going from one home to the other, you know, it's a reminder of the loss. And, and so they're dealing with that grief at another layer over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we all deal with grief differently. And some of us get sad and withdrawn, and some of us get pissy and irritable and, and, and push away. And, and again, I think that that's key to not, to not overinterpret that, not personalize that, but just that's where Junior needs to be right now, mm -hmm. and we'll just we'll have compassion. My, my, favorite, my favorite custody arrangement was a, a smart judge who said the kids get to stay in the house and it's the parents who every other week are out. Pack the bags. Absolutely. Pack the bag yeah. parents. And, yeah. and, and you know, when you say this to parents, parents look horrified, like, well, you mean I'd have to pack up my stuff? And, and it's like, because you want your kid to cope with that instead, right. right? You're okay with your kid coping with that, but you can't figure out how to pack your own bags. So. And I've known some brilliant parents, and I think this takes a degree of maturity I'm not sure I would have, um, <laughs> who decided to, to buy a duplex and, and live next door to each other mm -hmm. and, and learn and really work to set their stuff aside and really did a nice job. This was a number of years ago. I thought, how brilliant. And it's, a, again, a reminder that 
every every family figures out what works for them. And, 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 that, and we can just kind of sit back. We can facilitate that, but sometimes as clinicians and as professionals, we need to get out of the way so they can help mm. figure that out. That there are creative solutions. There are creative right. solutions to that, exactly. Yeah. Here's a question, Saprina. A woman uh, says, if the parents were divorced when the child was younger and then they remarry, what kind of effect does that original divorce? Will that, will, will, you know, like do the kids stand around waiting for the other shoe to drop again? Do they have some trust that the relationship will continue? Or is this like the, the Haley Mills parent trap <laughs> Disney <laughs> fantasy come true? Right. Well, I think oftentimes, um, oftentimes it depends on the tone in which the parents approach that. Mm -hmm. You know, so if the parents are really upset that the other parent has moved on or has a different relationship, if it becomes kind of this part of this battle, then I think kids do have a harder time. Um, but if it becomes a like, hey, you have someone else who cares about you and can do cool things with you and, and really loves you, then I think it really sets kids up for being okay. But it's again, parents being able to e either implicitly or explicitly give their child permission to, you know, it's okay for you to like your step parent. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a competition. So I think it, it is a lot in how parents frame it. That, that our hearts are big enough to let all, any, any time, any time that you have like yeah. a good adult in your life, I'm happy, mm -hmm. right. and, and that's better for you, therefore it's better for me. Yeah, absolutely, you know, I just want to echo what Sabrina said, I, I think is really a, a key takeaway from this entire conversation. The adults set the tone. The adults have a lot of power uh, to influence how their children perceive this and experience this uh, process from the beginning to throughout into their adulthood. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think to, to be mindful of that, to, to honor that and respect that, that, that as adults we set that tone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really hard to do when you're yourself in a, in a period of pain and, and coming out of conflict mm -hmm. and, and challenge, to figure out how to set that aside to, to help set this really healthier tone for the kids. Mm -hmm. That's let's, tough. Let's talk about talking about some of the hard topics such as finances because a lot for, for most families when there's a divorce there's there's a significant change in finances that's the reality right. of right. things and, and kids are going to experience that too mm -hmm. talk to us about how parents can talk with kids about that in a way that isn't blaming of the right. other parent well I think the two key ideas are to be tr as honest as is appropriate for the age of the child and to keep the adult information away from the, the kids. So although it's true that there may be financial difficulties, and, and I think kids can understand that, and you can explain that, you know, when families get divorced, it means that we might not be able to do all the things or buy all the things that we, we used to have until we kind of get things settled out set, or figured out, um, rather than saying, hey, we can't, you know, I can't buy you new clothes because your parent hasn't paid child support. You know, it it's, can be the same message, but really delivered differently. And if parents can have that conversations together with kids, that's that's an even greater, <laughs> better positive situation. situation. Absolutely. And you know, what what I like about what you just said, Saprina, is that there are many reasons why families experience changes in income. Divorce is only one. Oh, right. And so that that idea, you can approach it as this gives me a teaching moment for my child to be able to talk about the reality of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. that we're, we're, we're laid off right now. And, you know, we just came out of, and many families are still struggling with that, exactly. That is going to have some impact. That means certain things. Um, you don't need to get into the dollars and cents part of it. And again, particularly as far as that blame piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I think teenagers, that's probably more critical for them as they might be thinking about, uh, you know, activities are generally more expensive uh, and there are yeah. more opportunities. Uh, college and what does this mean? Um, you know, those are normal and natural conversations that occur in families. And of course, they're going to occur in families impacted by divorce. So again, um, keeping those boundaries clear, but, but just mm -hmm. the reality is, is there. They know that. Yeah. Now, so we, we were talking about situations where the, the parents have challenges with each other. How about when the, 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 the clever child has figured out that I can play mom off dad and vice versa? And this happens at, can happen at really young ages. Kids become very good at this. And so, you know, I think it's having the, the parents having the ability to call the other parent and check stories out. And it can be even small things, you know, 
um, parents get upset because the clothes didn't come back with the kid, with the child that they sent. Well, it may be because the child hid them because, you know, they ripped out their knee at, at school and they got in trouble for ripping out their knee in their pants. Um, it can be some of those normal things, but being able to kind of suspend out that this is kind of a negative parenting thing that the other parent is doing and call and check it out um, is one way to kind of stop that and to communicate to the child that you are on the same team and you will talk even though you might even not though be you're together. living in different houses. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, and, I, and I, 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 I agree that that sense of that communication with the other parent um, starting from a position of uh, curiosity mm -hmm. rather than assumption and blame. Help me understand this. Right. <laughs> Here's what my understanding is. Here's what I'm told. Um, not to play gotcha, but just to keep that, that communication. And I think it's real key that, that parents really from the, from the beginning engage in that communication directly. They leave the children out. They're not, the children aren't passing the notes. The, the children aren't being expected to, well, tell your other parent this or tell your parent that. Um, but that communication is, is direct, and, and, and we try to facilitate that without blame. And, and that on that note, because I'm going to yeah. cut you off, because um, I'm the parent in this, on, on, the, on this set, <laughs> I'm the go. parent. Uh, and, and we've reached the end of our time. Oh and and I, I said to Sabrina earlier in the week, I said, we've got an hour's worth of information yeah. here, not 30 <laughs> minutes worth of information. So what's the big take-home message? You heard from Paul and Sabrina over and over and over, the parents set the tone. You guys are the big kids. You're the big kids. It's your job to put those big panties on and pull them up and and have a, be sad aside from the kids. Let the kids come together and, and facilitate that good coping using some of the techniques that Paul and Sabrina talked about tonight. So thanks for coming and joining us tonight. And don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links and read my blog, the place where I answer more of your questions. You can also email us your questions about next week's show when we'll be talking about taking care while caretaking. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.